What's going on, everyone? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. I'm your host, Max Torres with Scoop Duck on 3, coming to you on Thursday, October 31st, 2024. Happy Halloween out there to everybody. I uh, hope you guys have some cool costumes picked out. Or maybe you're just sitting at home munching on some good candy. You can have your favorite candy. I'm always an M&M's guy. Maybe Kit Kats every now and then. But uh, we're here to, to give our final thoughts on Oregon versus Michigan. That game, of course, on Saturday afternoon, 12.30 p.m. Pacific kickoff on CBS. And joining me to break it all down is Scoop Duck owner and publisher, Justin Hopkins. J-Hop, how we doing? Good. Yeah, just uh, ready to get through the day, you know, I guess. I don't know. It's Halloween and, and my... My, my son actually didn't go to school this morning. He's a junior in high school. So he's like, Dad, can we go to the Halloween store and, and get a couple things? I'm like, bro, it's, it's the day of Halloween. But he's busy with sports, so I get it. And I guess my daughter's going out, but I won't. She, you know, she's going with her little girlfriends or whatever. So I guess I'll just go have a couple beers and watch Thursday night football. There you go. Sounds like a, a solid plan. What's your, um? I know you're a big beer guy, but do you have like a, a candy of choice? You got a sweet tooth or anything? I do not have a sweet tooth. It's probably one of my saving graces. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, typically people put out pie or cake or any of that stuff, and I have no problem absolutely not eating it. Like, it literally just – every once in a while, I, I like, oh, I'll have a little taste of that. And I would say I kind of like regular brownies. Like, I kind of like brownies every now and then just to get that flavor. Um, if I am grabbing a candy bar, which – Typically, I just pass over now for like a protein bar or something instead because they taste the same to me. Uh, Snickers. Snickers was the one that I that I would. Reese's are good. Snickers are good. Every once in a while, a Twix. Um, yeah. But honestly, I probably eat 10 candy bars in a year if I had to guess. Okay. There you go. Well, I, I don't know. I feel like I have a major sweet tooth. So maybe part of me just assumes that everybody has a sweet tooth. But I can definitely tell you I wish I had uh, an easier time steering clear of the sweets or, or turning down sweets because I think that would certainly help me and my overall health. But we got some football to talk about, Justin. I know you said you're watching Thursday night football. I believe that's Texans at Jets. So hopefully that's a good one. Things are going from bad to worse in New York uh, yeah. after Robert Sala got fired, former 49er DC. I'm always looking for that Niner angle. And then they brought in Devontae Adams uh, to reunite him with Aaron Rodgers and it hasn't gone too great. But that's why we got to see what happens in the game. And and the game that we're talking about is number one, Oregon versus Michigan. Um, just kind of wanted to flush out any of our final thoughts here uh, ahead of the game. I, I titled this what's on the line for, for Oregon against Michigan. So maybe that's where we can kind of start. For, for me, I kind of view this as far as what's on the line for Oregon. Th this is, I, I don't want to, I don't think it's too bold to say, this is your last pretty formidable test on the schedule, I think, as you as you kind of trudge your way here through the final month of, of the regular season, defending national champions. I know the season's not going great for the Wolverines, but they still got some really talented players. So if I'm Dan Landing in this Oregon coaching staff, I'm, I'm excited to see how my guys can perform against probably their most formidable opponent uh, the rest of the way here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, think, I think to me, you can call it 1A and 1B. I think you've got Michigan and you've got Washington. And I do think, you know, Michigan is a better football team than Washington. But 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 rivalries are different, right? You can't just base it on, you know, hey, this team is way more talented. When it's a true rivalry, you just kind of never know what's going to happen in that game. And, you know, it's going to be pretty easy for Jed Fish to get the, the Huskies fired up for Oregon especially if Oregon is undefeated at that time that they play Washington final final game of the year. But yeah, big game. Like there's no doubt it's a big game. It's a big travel game. Um, you know, obviously Oregon traveled to Purdue, but Purdue's just not a very good football team. Um, so at least in terms of uh, geography, distance, time it will take to travel, that will be similar. But this is going to be a pretty electric environment, right? It's going to be pretty loud, although there seems to be a lot of tickets for sale. So I don't know. It seems like maybe Michigan fans are a bit concerned. Um, I think the line has actually crept up, the betting line. So Oregon is a little bit of a bigger favorite now than they were when it opened. So um, 14 and a half on FanDuel is what I'm seeing right now. 14 and a half, yeah. So I, you know what? I mean, yeah, good game. If you're Oregon, you got to get out there and you got to execute, right? We know that. You've got to go out there and still play. Uh, this is the team that can beat you. We know they can run the football. 
um, going to a change at quarterback. So, you know, giving uh, Davis the whole week basically to, with the ones and, and getting reps there, maybe that makes him a little bit formidable this week. We don't know some unknowns and, and uh, I, I guess obviously if nothing else, they'll take it seriously. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of a big chance for Oregon. And like you said, I, I think I agree with you. Should Oregon win this game, it sure feels like that the path the rest of the way is is pretty manageable. And when I say that, let's not discount Wisconsin and having to go on the road out to Madison. I think Luke Fickle's a good coach. He's got a good team, but I feel like Michigan is probably a bit more talented, certainly in the trenches. So I think that's where we kind of uh, are, are going to see Oregon tested here the most. And, and maybe that's a a point we can talk about now, Justin. I think one of the matchups I'm most excited to see in this game is Oregon's offensive line against Michigan's defensive front because they are loaded with some dudes. Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant. Um, so you got Stewart uh, as well, Josiah Stewart. I mean, I was watching some of the highlights before we got on here, and, and his uh, strip sack uh, of Aiden Childs was just like, you don't want to see that guy coming after you uh, off the edge. So Oregon's offensive line, I think it, it's a – it's a work in progress, but in a good way. I think they've really done a tremendous job putting the first couple of weeks behind them. It feels like they're really gelling uh, right now. And I don't think you expected this group to be as good as last year's group. But I think if you're an Oregon fan, you're getting more confident in this offensive line with each week. And seeing how they can stack up against Michigan will, will give you a good idea of, I think, how they could potentially fare down the line with some of these big teams if, if we're – if we're looking ahead to a potential playoff matchup uh, down the line. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly the, I mean, honestly, just the line of the scrimmage on both sides. I, I agree. Oregon's offensive line's got a big test here. Um, and and to, to, to counter that, they have a big test every day, right? Because they're going against, uh, you know, their own defensive line in practice. So I think at least in terms of that, they're going to be prepared for, Hey, these guys are good. They bring it. We've got to be on our A game. Uh, but again, they've got to be on their A game and practice every day because uh, I don't think Derek Harmon and the boys take it very easy on them. And, uh, you know, yeah, on the other side of the ball, Oregon's defensive line, they, they've got to be disruptive. Okay. They've got to get back there and make Davis, uh, you know, just uncomfortable and make him move around the pocket. Um, I, I think they'll have some success there. But yeah, that's the game. The one thing about Michigan. Uh, and you, and as we started, you know, looking at them more and more this week, I know we recorded on Tuesday. Here it is on Thursday. Obviously, we read about Michigan all week. Uh, they're like super inefficient, right? They like they've got some players and they've got some dudes, but they really don't have like a team. Like they're just it doesn't come to and and that's both sides of the wall. I mean, they 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 give up really bad plays. Um, you know, they they rarely have like you know, sustained drives and they rarely do, uh, you know, on defense really just kind of come out clean. Um, so that's the one thing I think that kind of gives me pause. It's like, okay, you guys obviously got players, you've got talent, whether Will Johnson plays or not, I'm assuming he won't. I don't know. I just don't think he will. Even then they've got dudes, like they're going to have dudes that go in the first, second round of the NFL draft, uh, but they just don't play well together. And I don't know if that's leadership culture uh, coordinator thing. I, I don't know what it is. I don't cover Michigan every week, so I'm not there. Uh, but it certainly seems like something's a little bit off with the team overall. And I think that's their bigger, bigger issue that they're facing more so than talent this year, along with quarterback, because clearly that's been a problem for them. And, and you can have dudes on your team, but if those guys don't play together well, then you don't really have much there. So I think Michigan does have, I wouldn't say an advantage, but a positive development for them is it looks like they're going to have some consistency at quarterback, at least from you know week to week and, and getting Davis Warren some reps with the ones. This, this, this isn't a guy who's incompetent at quarterback. I don't I don't want people to think that that's how we're viewing this Michigan passing attack. It's, it's just segmented and you don't really know what you're going to get. We know that they've always been maybe not always, but they've been a run first team. That's kind of where they try to get their bread and butter. And we know Colston Loveland is an absolute stud of a playmaker out of the state of Idaho. So kind of in that Northwest region, inland Northwest, if you will. He, he's their go-to guy. He's Davis Warren's go-to guy at tight end. And I'm excited to see how the Oregon linebackers match up with him because this this is going to be one of their better tests this season from, from a playmaker standpoint. He, he can do everything. I think he had two touchdowns and a two-point conversion against Michigan State. 
um, at least in the highlights that I was watching. So that that's an absolute playmaker. And it's, it's going to tell us again, kind of like I was talking about with the offense, just how Oregon's defense I think is, is suited personnel wise to match up with uh, one of the better skill talents in Colston Loveland. Yeah, the run first for a reason, right? It's because they're not very good throwing the ball. Like they just haven't been good. I don't. I don't think they're all that good in pass pro as an offensive line. They've been wildly inconsistent, uh, you know, at quarterback. And outside of Colson Loveland, you're starting to like, okay, who are your options? Who are your receiving options? And so, I mean, it. You know, Oregon's balanced for a reason, right? Oregon's offense is balanced because they can run the ball. They can throw the intermediate ball, whether it's tight end or slot or whatever, and they can throw the deep ball, like makes them really hard to guard. USC, uh, conversely, is a throw throw heavy team for a reason because they can't run the ball very effectively, at least under Lincoln Riley, they haven't been able to. So, you know, I think that's the formula there. If you're Michigan, I think if they could throw the ball better, they would 100% do it. Uh, you know, so if it's me, if it's if I'm Tosh Lupoi, if I'm Chris Hampton, Dan Lanning, I'm 100% doing all I can to stop that run game and make them beat me with the throw. And if they start to do it on a couple drives or they start, you know, whatever, if they start beating me with the throw, all right, maybe we need to back up and respect that and, 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 and go to plan B. But um, so far they haven't been able to do that. And we're, you know, seven games into the season and, and they still haven't been able to do it effectively. So like you said, Colson Loveland, a tremendous tight end, extremely talented, um, really good player. Oregon's got to account for him, uh, you know, especially on like those third and eights, third and sixes, that situation, you got to know where he is at all times. But, um, you know, otherwise I'm coming up and I'm trying to stop the run and making them beat us with the throw. And if they have some success there, then we'll kind of, you know, reevaluate and, and maybe retool the defense. But, um, you know, with the way Oregon's balanced, it's going to make Michigan's defensive job very tough, right? Are you going to stop the run? Are you going to, you know, stop that intermediate stuff that Oregon likes to throw? Or are you going to, are you going to, you know, get beat by the deep ball? Because we know Oregon's got that too. So, very dangerous Oregon offensive team coming to town for sure. I got a, a defensive question. I kind of want us to kick around a little bit because I wrote about it yesterday and uh, I it generated some discussion over on the scoop duck message boards. It was in my three, two, one piece where I go three, three things we learned, two questions I have and one prediction. And my prediction was that Oregon is going to hold Michigan under a hundred rushing yards on Saturday something that I think you wouldn't necessarily expect given that Michigan is a run first team and they have only been held under a hundred yards once so far this year. That was week two against Texas at home in Ann Arbor. They had 23 carries for 80 yards and no touchdowns on the ground. And I think that they're going to be able to do this because of the personnel that they have, Maybe a little bit of extra juice from Derek Harmon, who says, you know, I, I don't like him. I'm going to leave it at that. Former Spartan playing in in the big house on Saturday for the Ducks. So I think they're really suited with their personnel to stop the run. And just look at what Michigan did in the last two games against Illinois and Michigan State. The last two weeks, they ran for 114 and 119 yards, respectively. So I, I'm not saying I expect Oregon to hold them under 100 yards, but it's a relatively one-dimensional offense, and, and Oregon has done a pretty good job bottling up most rushing attacks that they have faced. I think Quinshawn Jenkins and Travion Henderson ran for like 130, 140 uh, against, uh, in that Ohio State game. So you know, that's not an amazing performance, but I, I think Oregon is, is trending in the right way on defense, and, and that def defensive front, especially with Mateo Uyunglele, the way he's been progressing, I, I think they could pull it off. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you're seeing their rushing numbers decline because teams have figured out they can't throw the ball. I mean, that's just flat out what's happening. So uh, if you're an inferior team like Michigan State, uh, you're going to take your chance. To say, hey, let, let's just keep the run game in check. These guys aren't going to put up a ton of points that keeps us in the football game. That's a recipe for success if you're, you know, if you're Michigan State or Purdue or whoever that's quote unquote an underdog in those games. And, uh, you know, I'm with you. I know that, you know, like you said, uh, Judkins and Henderson did get uh, some yards against Oregon, but once again, just like with Ashton Genty earlier in the year, those came on two or three pretty good sized runs uh, for those two guys. So if you go and look at the body of work overall, they had a tough time running that football effectively, which is why they abandoned it uh, in the first place. And I'm talking about Ohio state. 
And Boise State, same thing. Oregon did a great job. That 170 yarder that Janty had was, you know, half of his yards on one play. Credit to him, obviously, phenomenal talent. But I mean, overall, you go look at what they did against the run game, they were great. So I feel good about Oregon's ability to, to, to stop or slow down the run here. Um, I think they'll be able to get back in the backfield. The only way, to me, the only way Michigan gets over 100 yards rushing in this game uh, or, or or truly kind of really break, like if they get 105, it's the same thing, right? Like, let's be real. But, if mm-hmm. you know, if they're up around 150 or 175, I think it's because they put Alex Orgy out there in s- certain situations and he runs the ball as the quarterback and, you know, maybe there's a, a, a breakdown or whatever there. So that's the only way I really see Michigan kind of opening up the run game is if we do see Alex Orgy back there, which I, I think we will. I think we'll see them put him in there situationally uh, for Davis Warren. And, uh, you know, we know he is a runner, so then you've got to spy him. But nice thing is, you know, Jeffrey Bass is not slow, and we know Devin Jackson's plenty fast. So, you know, Oregon's at least got speed at linebacker for that. And it would make sense for for Orgy to be out there, not only because he's a, a talented runner, Justin, but I think if you're in Michigan, you have to look at this matchup like, let's pull out all the stops. Why not? We have nothing to lose, especially – because you have to think how much would a, a win over a number one ranked Oregon mean to them with the rest of their schedule. They got to go on the road to Bloomington. I mean, how weird is it that we're saying that? Got to go on the road to face the Hoosiers. I've never said that in my life, but the Hoosiers look like they are for real under Kurt Signetti. So uh, shout out to the Hoosiers. They got to go on the road to, to face them. The Wolverines do. And then you got to go to the shoe. Uh, to, to wrap up the regular season with that Ohio State rivalry. So they, they are looking for some kind of momentum, and they'd love to do that against Oregon. Well, the and then before we go, because we won't talk about this, the rest of the Big Ten remaining schedule gets pretty wild. I mean, you've got, you know, obviously you've got Ohio State playing Penn State and Indiana. You know, that's going to be interesting. You've got Indiana playing Michigan and Ohio State. Uh I mean, there's just, I mean, you can see all these games are kind of building up and we got some really weird tiebreakers. So obviously if you're Oregon, if you win, it doesn't matter. You're going to be in the game. You're going to be first. You're good. It doesn't matter. But uh, should Oregon drop a game, you start looking at some of these other games, there's some really intriguing matchups and we could, we could be in for a wild finish in the big 10 potentially if Oregon doesn't handle business. There are some great games this weekend, and, and we'll get to some of those in a second, Justin. But first, got to give a shout out to Ranchito Grill in Springfield, proud sponsor of the Ducks Dish podcast. Not sure what your guys' dinner plans are tonight, but head on over to Ranchito Grill in Springfield at 1537 Mohawk Boulevard. Give their homemade tortillas a try. They got great food, a great environment, and they will take care of you. Say what's up to my guy, Ruben, and let him know that Max Taurus sent you. One other note, if you guys are watching us on YouTube, you can see it there on the bottom of your screen. want to let you know about our flash sale that we are running over at Scoop Duck right now. You can try us out for just a dollar. Gets you seven days of access ahead of this big game against Michigan and, of course, ahead of the early signing period that starts off on December 4th. So if you're a recruiting junkie, anything like that, just a big Duck fan, come check us out. That flash sale will roll directly into a 50% off your first year uh, membership. So just wanted to plug that real quick while we were talking here on the on the show. And Justin, let's kind of hop around college football a little bit. Maybe we'll top around the Big Ten and talk about some of these other big matchups that have our attention heading into the weekend. Um, I know that I, for one, am hoping to get up bright and early on Saturday morning to watch some college game day, but probably the game of the week, you got number three Penn State against number four Ohio State out there in Happy Valley. I believe that is the whiteout game for the Nittany Lions. What do you think about that one? I think that Penn State finally gets exposed. Like, I just don't think they're very good. I I haven't felt that, like, don't get me wrong, their record reflects that they're a solid team. I still just don't think that they're that good. Um, I don't think they're a complete team. Um, They haven't, frankly, they haven't played anybody yet. So um, we'll see. You know, Ohio State, man, you know, the Ohio State we saw at Oregon was a good team. Like, they, I mean, it was a great game. It was a great game. It's a good team. They've got talent on both sides of the ball. And then, you know, you see them since, and they've just kind of – they're kind of floundering, right? Like the Nebraska game was ugly, like for Ohio State. Like they they should have pummeled Nebraska, and they barely won. Like they kind of got lucky. So 
Um, which Ohio State shows up this week, assuming the one we saw that's sim- more similar to what uh, showed up in Eugene, uh, I think they should blast Penn State. Granted, I know it's at, in Happy Valley. I know it's it's a home game for Penn State. I just don't think they're very good. And James Franklin's record in big games is really poor. So I think Ohio State wins. I think they win. I don't want to say it's like 50 to zero, but I think they win convincingly, right? They win by 10, 12, 14, something around there. I, I, I think they'll have that game handled. Every year, Justin, I go into this matchup hoping for Penn State to win against Ohio State. And they just let they let you down every year in this game. And I think that's a big part of what you were talking about with James Franklin's record and in, in big games. Um, and for Ohio State, I think this is a, a huge opportunity for them to kind of get their marquee win that they were hoping to probably get in Eugene earlier this season. So um, I, I think that the atmosphere is going to be tremendous out there in Happy Valley. I know that um, uh, some big recruits are going to be there for that game. Um, Andrew Olesh, I think, is one of them. We'll talk a little bit recruiting later on in the show. But, yeah, I just I don't think I've seen – like Penn State only beat USC by three. USC isn't good. Um, and, and, yeah, that's that's like probably their biggest win. I guess Wisconsin, that, who they beat by 15 last week. I'm not seeing – I guess yeah, they had Illinois 21-7 to earlier on in the year. It's just, yeah, there's not, not that many convincing – or wins, I guess, the body of work that would give you a lot of confidence that they're going to be able to beat Ohio State. I just, I don't see it. No, they're, they're like Miami. They haven't beat anybody. Give me, and, and give Mario credit down there. He's, he's winning games like he's supposed to, but, I mean, they haven't beat anybody. You're like, okay, so how good is this team really? And, I mean, to be fair, we've had those questions about Oregon in the past, you know, when the Pac-12 wasn't as strong and, you know, Oregon would kind of sleepwalk to a 11-1 and or 12-0 and or – 10, you know, whatever. And you'd be like, well, how good is this team really? But that's how I feel about Penn State. And I I will say this in closing on this game. uh, One of these two coaches is about to catch a whole shitload of heat after this game. Like that's inevitable. Like, I mean, if you're you're James Franklin and you lose, obviously people are going to be like, dude, what is it going to take for this guy that we're paying very much? What more do you need? Yeah. Like, I mean, when's it going to happen? Like we're just, we continue to be the, third or fourth place team in the big 10 every year. And that's not a bad place to be, but they're not getting over the hump. And obviously I don't need to say it, but if Ryan day loses this game, I'm just going to be reading the Ohio state message boards. That's all I can say. For sure. For sure. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens on that one. Uh, that that's a, a fun one to look forward to another big game that we're kind of keeping our eye on from a distance here, Justin around the big 10 on saturday is usc against washington trojans hit the road head up to seattle to face the huskies that game is at 4 30 p.m pacific on big 10 network and you have two teams that are pretty middling pretty mediocre um i I think they might actually both be four and four um which is kind of crazy yeah they're both four and four um jed fish is his first year i don't think expectations are that high given how the roster was gutted uh and, and just what he had to work with when when he arrived on mont lake but for usc and lincoln riley it is every game is is must win right now given how the the season has unfolded obviously you you had the the loss to maryland that was was brutal um three straight just really close losses and then you played last Friday and you got a 22 point win over Rutgers. So you took care of business and did what you were supposed to there. But I, I think that you got to head into this game. If you're a Trojans fan, just still a little bit on edge because you, you haven't been able to consistently put it together. Uh, and um, I think that a lot of people I listen to uh, locked on USC every now and then with uh, Mark Culkin, who writes for our uh, we are SC site with Scott Schrader. And, and he thinks that USC needs to run the ball more and they've been able to, to do that somewhat successfully. And so he thinks that Lincoln Riley's kind of gone away from that, but that that's not really been their identity under Lincoln Riley because he's this quarterback savant, the quarterback guru, but clearly Miller Moss is not the same caliber of quarterback that he's had during his career. So um, I don't know if I'm saying Lincoln Riley's getting exposed, but uh, I, I was never a firm, firm believer that he was going to be the guy to bring USC back to the promised land. Well, you, you got to have balance unless you have elite skill guys, unless you're, you know, I mean, you can throw the ball 
and and win games, you still got to run the ball. Like you, I mean, you have to run the ball. You have to be able to to run it on short, you know, third down and short. You have to be able to run it near the goal line. Uh, late in games, you want to have that. Even in the chip years, when it was just when he was throwing the rock and throwing the rock, he still had to knew he had to have a run game. He'd get close to the end of the game, and you want to milk the clock, right? Well, it's harder to do that throwing it than it is running. And and Chip knew that, and Lincoln doesn't know that apparently. So, uh, yeah, if you're an Oregon fan, you're really kind of identifying who you hate the most this weekend because. Again, you've got USC versus UW. You've got Ohio State versus Penn State. And I would argue those are probably at least three, if not four teams that are probably in the in the top ten, more like top six or seven of teams that you dislike nationally. And so you're really kind of figuring out like, all right, which one am I rooting for here? Who do I want to win? Does it matter? Um, you know, USC versus UW, it doesn't really matter who wins because they're recruiting – you know, second tier guys that really Oregon's not after. So I guess it matters to them, but doesn't really matter to Oregon so much. Um, you know, Ohio State, Penn State, that becomes a really big, that game has implications because of conference affiliation and both those teams being, you know, at or near the top of the pecking order right now. So yeah, you're going to figure out who you like and who you, who, who you like less than others, I guess, this weekend. Um, I, I, I think. Uh, who are you rooting for? You get, give me who you're rooting for in that one. Uh, I mean, I I think Ohio State beats Penn State. It's not a matter of rooting. I just think that's what happens. Um, I, sure. believe, I believe that's what will happen. That said, the fallout from Penn State winning would be epic. I would love to. I would love to see that from afar. Uh, as far as USC, I, I think I want UW to win, um, not for any reason other than like right now, just piling on Lincoln Riley seems like it just seems like the thing to do. Everybody's doing it. Um, there's a team that entered the season with a lot of expectations. Uh, the first week win over LSU, you saw, you know, take out like, oh, they got the defense figured out. They're back. Miller Moss is Miller Moss can be a dude. They're going to be okay. And then it's all been like this, you know, since. So uh, I think a USC loss to what looks like a very average UW team would really send Trojan fans into a spiral. And uh, I guess I'm just here for all of the chaos. I'm I'm in for the chaos too, and and it feels like we're that the more chaos, the more potential for chaos. The closer we are getting into silly season, um, I don't know why I'm just more excited this year than I have been in the past. I know it's going to be super crazy on our end, just covering all of it, but just the the fallout from all of it would be crazy. I do legitimately wonder how long of a leash uh, James Franklin would have at Penn State if they can't get it done, because um, I don't have they ever beaten Ohio State under his. Since he's been think, there, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, and that's—I mean—that's the best barometer that you have as an administration of can this guy, you know, take us all the way, or at least you know, get us into that playoff conversation. So that'll be interesting. And then, yeah, I think I'll probably say I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not pulling for the Huskies, but I'm maybe hoping that they win because I just love seeing the chaos uh, around Lincoln Riley and and the Trojans right now. Um, what do you say we? Hold on, James Franklin is one and nine against the Buckeyes. <laughs> Dang, one so I, I don't know when the one win was. I just did a quick Google, and that's what came up. Okay, gotcha. One and nine, ten, 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 ten times you've won one. <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. What do you uh, What do you say we wrap up with a little bit of recruiting talk, Justin? Uh, some Oregon twenty twenty five recruiting tidbits. I think an increasingly interesting recruitment to follow here, Justin, in the 2025 class is four-star Michigan tight end commit Andrew Olesh, who was in Eugene for what I think might have been his first visit for the Illinois game. I don't think he'd been there before, to my knowledge, but it seems like the, the visit went really well. I think the quote that Chad Simmons got was it was a phenomenal visit. And again, I think it's worth saying, you know, who's going to have a bad visit to Oregon? Uh, you, you were used to getting great return out of uh, out of the the recruiting visits uh, when we hear about him and interview these guys. But he's heading to Happy Valley this weekend. He's from Pennsylvania. Penn State seems like they're they're looming in that recruitment. He's going to be out to Notre Dame as well for an official visit. But it sounds like a return to Eugene for an official visit is also in the cards. And I think that points to the great work this Oregon staff has done to get him out to Oregon for the Illinois game on an unofficial visit, knowing that if that goes well, you hope to be able to get him back for an official visit. 
So that, that recruitment kind of feels like a wild card to me right now, Justin. I wrote our uh, hot board for the offensive class over this morning on Scoop Duck, and uh, Vander Plug is obviously trending to Oregon in the 2025 class. He's committed to Washington right now. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about him, but we know the Ducks would like to get at least one tight end. Two would be even better. But as we kind of manage this trio of Andrew Olesh, Vander Plug, Lincoln Cure at tight end, um, that the developments keep coming and we should probably expect that because Oregon doesn't have a tight end right now. So what, what do you make of all that going on? Yeah. I mean, you just, you know, you're giving yourself options. Um, you know, that's what you have to do. It's really tough when you just lock in on one or two guys and, you know, you miss both or you miss one or whatever the case is. So, you know, with regards to Olesh, I mean, I think like if, if I was asked to pick where he ends up right now, I would probably say Penn state. I think, you know, I think Oregon is, probably running either third or maybe tied with second. And I think Penn state's the team to look out for right now. So, um, you know, I, I agree getting him back on campus, uh, is paramount. Honestly, that's the recruitment right there. If Oregon cannot get Olish back on campus for an official visit at some time, uh, they're not going to get him. Like, I just don't, I don't see them getting him. So, um, that's kind of what I'm watching for. Uh, if, if he was picking tomorrow, and, you know, I, you know, Oregon, Michigan, Penn State. I know Notre Dame's lurking, but I think they're behind everybody right now. Um, I think I think Penn State's the team to beat, and I think Michigan and Oregon are kind of battling it out uh, just behind them. So we'll see. Uh, you know, you feel good about Vanderplug. You know, obviously he's going to go visit Washington this weekend. I know we're going to touch on that, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I I think I think you feel good if you're Wash, or excuse me, if you're Oregon and you're Drew Maringer, and you can get Plug in the fold. And then you just keep working on Olesh and Cure. And if you can get one, awesome. And if you're not able to get one of those guys, there's going to be somebody in the portal. I mean, like, I mean, tight ends are going to move and there's, you know, there's lots of talent out there at that position. So I don't see it as a, as a way to panic. I, I do think it would, it would be great if Oregon could get Olesh uh, or Cure to go with Plug. And I think for Plug, this weekend becomes the um, kind of the decision time, right? I think he's, obviously back and forth with Washington and Oregon. I think you go back to Washington, give them a chance to make their last pitch or make sure that, you know, confirm whichever decision you have, which is either I'm going to stick with Washington or I'm going to, you know, change my mind and go to Oregon. I think that's what this visit's all about. So at least if nothing else, maybe get some answers there. And then, like you said, you just keep working on Olesh and you keep working on cure and see what you can do. And for Plug, I think getting him back on campus for that official visit was great. And, lends itself to some momentum for Oregon because I, I wrote this morning, like getting him back on campus for his official visit with his family, I think was huge. He is a really big family guy. And I think that was kind of like, Hey, this is what I'm seeing in Oregon. Are you guys seeing it? Are you on board with this? So that's kind of how I viewed it. But obviously I think he, he is the kind of, of guy from getting to talk to him and cover him that, that would hear Washington out. He's been incredibly complimentary of Washington throughout the whole process. And, and my time talking to him and recruiting and, covering him and his recruitment. So that that's kind of how I see it too. You, you're looking pretty good for Plug. You'd love to get one of Cure or Olesh. I'm feeling less confident right now about Cure than I was maybe a couple weeks ago, Justin, because he did get back to Kansas State. We know that's an easy trip for him to make, but I'm not ready to count out the Ducks completely because he's still got a couple of home games on their schedule, and we know how much one visit can, can really change things in a recruitment. So I think I'm giving the edge to Cure in terms of who I'm feeling more confident about right now compared to Olesh, but I, I don't know. I think you got two really talented guys. I think you have more of a head start with Cure just because you've been involved in that recruitment for so much longer. You got to feel better about your relationships there, but uh, clearly Olesh is, is at least willing to hear him out. Yeah. Like I said, um, you know, I agree. I think, yeah, I mean, I don't know that Oregon has a great shot at either one right now, but you could ask me that again in two or three weeks and it could be a different answer because that's where we're at in the recruiting cycle. So yeah, you just keep keep the pedal down, keep winning, um, you know, try and get out there and visit them and 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 see if, you know, that makes a difference. And uh, yeah, the, both of them are going to be tough polls. There's no doubt both are going to be tough polls. So I just don't think, I think both of us agree. We're not trying to set up Duck fans to say, yeah, well, Oregon will get Plug in the, bo in the boat and then get one of those guys. I'll keep working on them and they might get one, but there's absolutely no guarantee that they will. One more guy we talk about. Let's talk about uh, Justin before we get out of here. Jakeem Stewart, he is the probably the top defensive target still left on Oregon's board here in 2025. I think Naeem Offord would be your other one. 
uh, in terms of just really high pro- profile guys. You obviously have Caleb Burns, the Baylor linebacker commit, McKay Madsen, the uh, Clovis linebacker. But you and I have been talking about him a lot. And I wrote coming out of that trip that I thought Oregon had the lead. And then yesterday, Steve Wolfong was on with Josh Newberg saying that he'd probably give the edge to Oregon right now. And that was great to see and to hear because that's kind of how I've been feeling here. But the caveat here, there's still a month to go in this recruitment, which is a lifetime when it comes to recruiting. He's still going to go out to Ohio State. I think he's still supposed to go out to USC, but I don't really view them as much of a threat there. Uh, I'd be shocked if he didn't get back out to LSU because he's in New Orleans, in Louisiana. But then he's going to come out to Oregon during their bye week before wrapping things up trip-wise in Columbus with the Buckeyes. So I think Oregon's got a great shot here. The the on-field product continues to speak for itself. And um, I I think that uh, they they probably feel good about where they're at. But it's, it's hard to say anything is any kind of a slam dunk when you're going against some recruiting giants like Ohio State and, and LSU. Yeah, I'm, those are the three. Um, and you can make an argument for any of the three. Obviously, LSU has been on them for a long time, has had the most confidence, Ohio State and Oregon kind of surging here uh, in the last few weeks or what what have you. So, yeah, I mean, for it to, you know, for Wilt Fong, everybody to come out and say, hey, you know, Oregon might lead or I'm giving the edge to Oregon. Like, that's great news, but that's, I mean, there's so much work. To, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done there. So I would just kind of urge Oregon fans to hey, just pump the brakes a little and let's see this thing play out because, you know, here we are uh, just about to turn the calendar in November and, you know, November to the beginning of December, this thing could go four different ways easily. So just kind of let it play out. Again, I know I said this about Olish. I'll say it about Jakeem Stewart, which I did say when he left. You're going to have to get him back on campus. You've got to get him back on campus. I know there's a tentative visit in place for him to come back. He has to come back. So uh, if that doesn't happen, I, I do not give Oregon much of a shot unless they get him back on campus. If they do, then I feel that, hey, we, we can continue talking about him in this light. Sure, sure. Well, um, I think that's pretty much what we had for recruiting and, and for our show today. Um, and any other kind of last thoughts before we wrap up? Nope, nope. Uh, like I say, every time, thanks for the support. And I know you put it down there, but a bucket scoop duck and silly season coming up. I mean, for a dollar, I don't know why you wouldn't try it out. I mean, you know, even if, if you know, if times are hard and it is for all of us, it's still only a buck and you can check it out. And it's the cheapest entertainment you can buy on the planet. I guarantee that. There you go. Yeah, it's uh, no better time. No better time than right now. Uh, love the message board community that we have and just uh, everything going on right now. Uh, at Scoop Duck, it's uh, it's a fun time, and it's going to get even crazier. Ducks are number one, uh, so plenty to talk about, plenty to talk about. But that'll do it for Justin and I here on today's episode of the pod. Uh, if you want to find more Justin, you can find him on Twitter slash X at jhopkinsSD. Find me anywhere at M Torres Sports. Subscribe to the Scoop Duck on through YouTube channel. We are getting ever closer to two thousand subscribers, uh, and the support we've seen from you guys is absolutely phenomenal. We greatly appreciate it. And then come and see us at scoopduck.com. But uh, other than that, thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast.